is Shiloh Bijou, and you are listening to Grit and Grace. From a train wreck drunk to a multimillionaire, we have the Tom Chenault on the show today. Welcome to Grit and Grace. I am Shiloh Bijou, and let's get started. How are you, Shiloh? What's going on? I am amazing, and I'm super excited to have you on here. Obviously, we have lots to talk about in a condensed period of time, but um, you, you are um, an, an amazing man, number one. I mean, I can do all the bio stuff and go into it. We'll let you share a little bit, but basically, to me and to what everyone needs to know for everyone out there is... You are a man, one of the people who helped save my life and get me on an incredible journey. And I'm always forever indebted to you and grateful for you. So, oh my gosh, let's get started. I love the intro. I love that I can say that because you are one killer person and you just, you just have the best personality. I was just telling our editor, Chris, I'm like, you know, I I can't wait for Tom to come on because you're going to get like all the things. There's no filter. He's fabulous. And the stories that we're probably going to be sharing are going to be fun. So let's talk about it. 1988, 1988. What happened? Uh, 1988, I was a big time stockbroker and I was married. I had two kids and in the middle of Denver is a street called Colorado Boulevard. And on the West side of Colorado Boulevard, about four miles west, was my home in a place called Con- uh, Columbine Country Club. And in that home, I had no alcohol. I had a wife and I had two kids. And on the east side of Colorado Boulevard was the brokerage firm in my other life. And I literally lived two lives. And I was this crazy, alcoholic, unbelievably high-achieving stockbroker. And so my income in 1988 was $877,000, which in today's dollars is a ton of money in any, by any stretch of the imagination. So I was going, I was going crazy, you know, business wise, and I climbed to the top of the ladder. I just didn't realize until shortly after that, that I'd climbed to the top of that ladder and I was looking down upon all the people. I had an unbelievable ego, massive low self-esteem. And I realized when I got to the top of that ladder that I had it leaned against the wrong wall. And I had to be against that wall over there. And the unfortunate thing about that is you have to go all the way down the ladder to go back up. And that's kind of what happened. And I was a drunken stockbroker. I was a drunken airplane salesman. And I was a drunken restaurant guy. But I was good at what I did because I just pushed that pig through the python snake no matter what. And no matter what the consequences were, I was going to make the money. And it was a wild time, Shiloh of epic proportion, um, just crazy stuff, crazy stories of just barely making it through, making it out alive. I was uh, selling airplanes up in Billings, Montana, and uh, I was with my friend Mel, and Mel, I almost said his last name, and Mel had all the vending machines in Montana, and he was as big an alcoholic as me, and a skirt chaser, married just like me, and we're just having the time of our life in Billings one time, and uh, we're at the Billing Sheraton and we meet these girls and they kind of think we're nice and we think they're nice. So we go over to Mel's house to drink some cocktails and we're in the, we're in this. So Mel goes to make the cocktails and I'm in the swimming pool with the girls and our clothes have mysteriously fallen off and things are about to get interesting. And all of a sudden I hear this loud noise. And what has happened is his wife is upstairs at the house and she's got a gun and she is literally shooting at us. And Mel, oh, yeah. had, Mel had forgot his wife was home. <laughs> so, yeah, so that was a terrible. So we we just learned a massive lesson there. In fact, we made we like belt like like blood brothers. We made a pact. We pricked our fingers and we said to each other, "Are we hereby will never drink alcohol in Billings again?" So we made that vow because we didn't want to make that mistake ever again. So we thought we would drink alcohol over in. Uh, Bozeman, Montana, home of Montana State University. A lot of co-eds there, a lot of bars, great town. So we fly over there. Same stupid story. I fly. I flew the airplane. So we get over to Billings. I'm in a beach craft bonanza. It holds four people, good little single engine airplane. And we land and we head for the bar. We get smashed as usual. We meet these girls. Same story. They think we're kind of nice. 
and I'm going to completely PG this story. And it's so completely awesome. So the next thing you know, they're going, oh, man, if we could just keep partying. And we said, yes, we can. Certainly, that'll be fun. So they thought we were going to another bar. We went to the liquor store, bought a case of beer and a, and a couple of bottles of Crown Royal and headed for the airport. And our move was to go to Wendover, Nevada, where they don't, it's right out, it's where the all the Mormons go. It's on the other side of Salt Lake on the border between Utah and Nevada. And that's where all the Mormons sneak to to drink. So we yeah. just jumped in the airplane and this was a great idea. And we head out in this single engine airplane four hours. Everybody's already got to go to the bathroom. They think they're in the airplane immediately with Charles Manson and Ted Bundy. And we're headed to Wendover, Nevada, which is a four hour flight in a little tiny airplane. And immediately it starts turning into Fantasy Island in reverse. They want no part of me. They want no part of Mel. They're just complaining the whole time. And we're just puttering along to Wendover. Finally, about five years later, we come over the hill. There's the city of Wendover. And uh, I click the runway lights and start descending to where the city is. So I, I'm descending and I click the runway lights to turn them on. And that's how they conserve uh, energy. If you click the mic five times, it turns on the runway lights. I click it five times, runway. They forgot to turn on the machine that turns on the runway lights. So now we have to keep flying and go over to a place called Reno, Nevada, or we have to turn left and fly over Salt Lake, over to Salt Lake, land there, and then you know, obviously there's no booze there. So that's a terrible idea, nor, nor any casinos. So we're just about to head for Reno. And Mel looks down and says, Tom, I've got the airport. I go, I can land this thing in the dark. So we turn off the engine and we point this thing at the ground and we are, and these girls already think that we're crazy. They don't like us. We're not, nobody's having really any fun. So, so when you fly airplanes, what you do is you, you turn off the power pretty much, you take it down and then you put, you, what you have to do is be a thousand feet above the runway going downwind, parallel the runway at about a hundred miles an hour. So then you turn, so that's what we did. So we go into this, we go into, this is a terrible story that ends happily. So we're, we're, we're flying perfectly right down the road and Mel is on, Mel's got the, Mel's got the radio and I've got the airplane and we're flying parallel the runway. We're a thousand feet off the ground. I've got the flaps down and we start to turn base, which is a left turn before you turn final. And I turn, I'm starting to turn base and this girl in the back starts making this noise that is unearthly. It's the craziest noise I've ever heard out of my life. And she keeps ramping it up and I can only, and anybody old enough to remember the O.J. Simpson trial, uh, that guy named Cato Kalin said that that dog made an unearthly tone and no one's ever heard that tone. I've heard that tone. This girl's making that unearthly tone. But once you turn, once you've got the, the runway right behind you, you turn off the engine because you've got the runway made and you just start gliding in for a landing. So I come straight down. So we turn final and she is screaming at the top of her lungs at us. And we don't know what's going on. And now I don't know if you've ever been that drunk, but when you're driving a car and you're that smashed, you see double. It's the same thing in an airplane. So I'm looking down there and I'm seeing double. I can't even see the runway. I, it's just double. So I go, Mel, I can't, I can't see. And he, so I put my hand over my eye over i put my hand over this eye because yeah. i needed to be able to handle the control yoke and mel started handling the engine now he's got the radio and the engine <laughs> and we're coming in and i throw the i throw the gear down and we're about to land and i all of a sudden she ramps up the noise like 10 times more so i finally look over my shoulder at her like this and i've never seen this happen in my life shiloh her eyeballs literally bugged out of her head they were like this far out like one of those cartoons and she is, she can't even breathe. She's just pointing. And instead of it has saying it was an FBO, it's a little terminal there. And we're just coming in for that terminal. And instead of that being a terminal, I looked down at what she's pointing at and it said Kmart. I had almost landed that airplane in the Kmart parking lot. 
which takes me to what a great salesman I am because we, you know, that scared us. I mean, that was terrible. So we were, so now we're just scared. So I, we got, we turned on the power and got out of there. And so we're, so now we've got to make a decision. We're either going to go to Reno, which has a mountain between Wendover and Reno or straight across the great salt Lake, which is flat. And as messed up as we were, we thought we would take the safer, shorter route. So we flew over to Salt Lake, landed in Salt Lake, rented a car, went over to Wendover, did the casino thing, kept drinking all night long. And here's the good thing about Tom Chenault, the salesman. Those girls got back in the airplane to fly back to Billings. I mean, to uh, to uh, Bozeman. Oh, my God. Is that the best drunk story you've ever heard? <laughs> I think the best part of that story, which is completely true alcoholics, is even when you're getting shot at, let's go back to that. You yeah. make a pact not to quit drinking. We just don't drink at the house. Oh, no question. <laughs> but that's what we do. And we're always negotiating with death and the devil. Oh, 100%. You know, I can, I can relate to the story about the one eye. I, I didn't, I have not drove drunk a lot in my later years, but I'll tell you the early 20s Shiloh did. I cannot believe how many times I should have been dead. But I mean, I did that. There was times I'm like, if I just cover my eye, yeah, you got this. And I had a girlfriend with me once. I scared her so bad. I was passed out at the wheel for more than five, 10 minutes. And she yeah. looked at me and she goes, Shiloh. And I just went like that, straight face and just sat there and looked at her. She's like, you just passed out. And I'm like, we're good. We got this. I couldn't see nothing. Like, right. oh my God, the stories. That is epic, crazy, and welcome to alcoholism. <laughs> oh my God. Oh my God. Yeah, I can totally. Yep. I've been in similar situations, maybe not an airplane, but definitely just the mentality and yep. I'm a salesman too. Like I can sell you anything, and yeah. especially if it's to drink, if it's to have a drink, I'll get you to do anything so I can get that drink. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> so that's been my life. I sobered up in 88 and I uh, went to AA and uh, got something called a sponsor. And in AA, when you get the sponsor, you have to listen to the sponsor and they take you through these things called the 12 steps. So initially when you walk into AA, First time I ever walked into an AA meeting, I about had a heart attack because I just thought there were going to be a bunch of winos laying on the floor. And it wasn't that way. I'm going, you've got to be kidding me. Who are these people? They're normal people. So all of a sudden, here comes this guy named uh, Penny. It wasn't a guy. It was a woman named Penny. And uh, her husband had a Rolls Royce. I, I knew her husband. And they also had a beautiful 1932 five window coupe. They were loaded. They lived in my neighborhood. And I walked into the AA. Oh, I also, I also knew that if I did go to these meetings and I did sober up, I could still go to the men's grill at Columbine Country Club, where there is a code of honor at a level you wouldn't believe and no one would turn me in. I was sure of it. I was positive, the, the code of silence. And I walk in the door and Miles' wife was Penny and Miles was the president of Columbine Country Club. And Penny looked at me and said, Tom, there's a chair in here with your name on it and we've been waiting for you for a very long time. So I couldn't even do that. that the jig was up right there on the spot. And that was such a blessing because I had no wiggle room. I could, the con was over. And fortunately I stuck around along, along enough to, uh, to be here for 12, over 12,000 days. I've been sober for now over 12,000 days. So, That's a long, that is a very long time between cocktails. It, it is, it is. And you know what? We don't get in those rooms because we had a great day before or a week before we get in or there. Or because you were up. singing too loud in the choir. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, I have shared my story a little bit, but when I walked into that, you know, walked into the Zoom room, you know, when I came in, your head's hanging down, you feel like shit. You know, I had just basically blew my cover to the world when I did it. And I was, I was at my lowest. I'm like, this is it. But I have been, you know, I always tell people I was praying to God for years to help me with this. He just did it in a way I didn't want, but it got me in the room. It got me introduced to you. And so I guess what, what was the last thing for you? What was it that got you in the room? In the rooms? Yeah. Uh, my friend, Chuck Kirby 
what oh he's, I said his last name. He's a great guy. He was a stockbroker with me and he was a real alcoholic and the most miserable. I was a happy drunk. He was mean. So you'd go in a bar and we, that's why I hung out with him because we were opposites. And we'd go in a bar and he'd just grab a pool cue and start swinging at people. He was a lot of fun, but he was also nuttier than a fruitcake too. And just a great guy. And uh, he had a wife and lived in a place called Roxborough Park. And he was a huge stock trader, like unbelievable. He went to school at a college called Babson, and which is one of the best schools in Boston, Massachusetts. And he came, he had a high intellect and he went to this rich kid school and everybody else had a little, they had stenographers, the students. And Chuck like was eating baked beans all day long. He was so poor and just a great guy. And he left there and turned around and made millions of dollars. And he was a stockbroker. And he and I just hit the streets hard, gotten more trouble than you'll ever believe. And finally, his wife had, oh, I forgot to tell you, he lived in this giant house in a place called Roxborough Park, and his wife had moved out, and the homeowners association was all pissed off at him because he wouldn't mow the lawn or do anything or paint the house. So finally, he called up and said, okay, paint my house, and it was profanity laced, and he painted the whole house, including the windows, black. So the whole house was black, including the windows and the doors. And I drive up to his house and I just started laughing because he didn't show up for work for a week. So I was sure he was dead and I was going up to find his body. So his wife, his wife had moved out completely. And uh, and we're supposed to, this is what the way you want this show going, right? Absolutely. Okay, good. So um, I don't want anybody to think less highly of me. Oh, <laughs> no, 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 no. So it's here's the deal. all the time. Okay, so here's the deal. So we get, so I get there, and his, his wife's moves all the furniture out. There's not a stick of furniture in this mansion, and so I'm looking around. So I walk in, and there's a great big dish on the counter, and it's a turkey. It's all turkey bones and things like that, and the preparation of a turkey and bottles and things like that on the countertop, and no furniture anywhere. So I search the whole house, and I think, oh my God, he's hung himself somewhere. And as an alcoholic, you know, you're like, you don't even care because you're an alcoholic, and you, you know, it's just like. Oh shit, he killed himself. Now I got to go find the body. So, and he's my best friend. So I finally walk in this room and there he is laying on the floor in this closet and he's like unconscious and perfectly straight. And he's laying there. And in the old days, the cocaine, the grams of cocaine were kept in these little packets called snow seals. So he's laying there completely unconscious, surrounded by turkey bones, a bottle of rum and the snow seals. And he's unconscious. And I go, Chuck, are you dead? He goes, no, I'm not dead. I go, what's going on? He goes, you got to take me to treatment. And I go, what's treatment? And he goes, just call this place. It's called Cottonwood Hill. I go, what is it? He goes, just call the number, Tom. It's on Ward Road. It's in Arvada. Just call it. So this story, I remember like it was yesterday. And everything I'm telling you is 100% true. So I go, shit, okay. So I pack him up. And we head for treatment. And I've got one of those Audi 5000 Quattros in 1988 or 1989. Coolest car ever. And so we're driving along and we're in this trance. There's not a moon. It's so dark. It's unbelievable. And we're driving down this road called Titan Road. And it's surreal because I don't know where we're going, but I know it's not going to be good. He's like, just come to. And he's we're just sitting there staring straight ahead. And we go across this bump on Titan Road and I look up and there is a train light like that big, like five feet from me. I had run the train tracks out in the boondocks with a train coming and it didn't run over us. It must have run through us because it was right there. I, we lived. And we're just going, holy shit, what just happened? So we drive for 4,000 hours, about like the trip to Wendover. And we go up this hill in the middle of nowhere and down this hill. And there's a little house at the bottom of the hill. And at the bottom of the hill is this dumpy house. And I'll never forget this. We walk in. We're still scared to death. And there is a basketball court there with a net with no net on it, which it, with, a, with a hoop with no net on it which is a mortal sin in my world. And I, and I ultimately brought like five nets to that place saying that can never happen again. But I go, these people are messed up to have a basketball hoop and no net. So we walk in the door, there's a 40 watt light bulb on and we walk through this door and the stairway downstairs goes 
And as they go downstairs, there's this woman that looks like Colonel Clink or Nurse Ratchet at the bottom of the stairs sitting behind this desk. And she goes, what do you want? And I go, this is my friend. His, his name is Chuck Kirby. He's an alcoholic and he's here to do something. He's got an appointment. She goes, sit down. So we sit down and we're scared to death of her because she's mean. And so he fills out the form and then he says, okay, I'm in. I need to call my wife. And that lady looked at him and said, you, did you sign that form? He goes, yeah. Well, you just signed your rights away to call anybody. You ain't calling anybody. She puts her hand down like that and just scared me. I'm like ready to shut her. And the next thing you know, these two giant guys walk through the door to grab him, but they grabbed me. And I go, what is going on? And they go, you're going with us. I go, what? And the lady goes, he'll be here soon, but it's not his day. He's the alcoholic. And they took Chuck away. So he's in, now he's in treatment for 30 days. And so I'm doing everything I can to help him get drunk. I'm, you're not supposed to have bones. So I, in the middle of the night, I literally did the army crawl about 200 yards to sneak him a phone out in the yard so he could call, you know, important people like me on the phone. I did everything. And then I made a deal that I was not going to drink during the month. But it, so, the, so the whole month, I'm going to support him because he's the alcoholic, not me. So the whole month, I said, I'm not going to drink. By the end of the first week, I had broken that promise to the point that I would, first I said, I won't, okay, I can't do that. I won't drink on the way to the meetings to see him. And by the time it was over, I won't drink at the meetings with him. So, I mean, I was just, you know, I'm always negotiating with the devil again in death. And so we finally get out of there and it took, he's still sober. He's six months more sober than me. And we left there. And I go, what are we going to do? He goes, you got to go to AA. I go, what are you talking about? He goes, you got to go to AA too. You can't stay sober. And I go, oh, yes, I can. He goes, really? And anyway, he was right. And I started to go to AA and I never looked back. I've been there for 33 years. Every day. I went this morning, I texted know. you in the meeting. I know you did. <laughs> I do. I, every, I never call, I never text anybody and say, go, go to the meeting. I always go, oh, Shiloh, your hair looks so nice today or something <laughs> other than, and all that is, is a Tom Chenault reminder that you might've forgotten that the meeting just started because it's that important to me that I'm there and the people that I love. And I, I really believe I made a deal with God sometime during that point that if I help alcoholics and drug addicts and kids in their life, from this horrific disease, God's gonna help me make a living. And I think God's done a far better job on his end of that equation than I have. And that's where I am today. My whole life is given to that. I love it, but you've saved many, many people or helped guide them to save yeah. themselves. I mean, obviously it takes us as well and God and your higher power. Um, you know, and I love that you message when I forget. I actually didn't forget the meeting. I was, I, the minute I got it, I looked down and I'm like, shit, <laughs> I was like, I know I'll see you in a little bit. Um, but it's, it's been an interesting journey, but when we talk about, you know, you, you are very open with your journey and I think it's incredible. Not everybody has to do that. Not everybody chooses to do that. You chose it. You speak on many stages. You have people in, in our industry, multi-level marketing, obviously that absolutely come to you all the time. I know many people that you've helped and they still are sober and it's an incredible story. And then obviously we lose people along the way, which we always have to remember. There's, there's so many people dying of this disease every day. Yeah. And I don't think people really understand how many it is. And it's, it's a killer. It's a family killer. It's a, it's a killer of many things, but it is killing a lot of people all the time. And then we went through quarantine. Oh my God. I mean, you want to talk about alcoholism on, on the, on the rise. It's just crazy. We, our liquor store never had, didn't have a line outside of it. Never didn't have a line. So it was pretty incredible, but, um, Let's talk about something funny. Okay, so today I was thinking about what am I going to ask Tom today because we could go all over the place, but we're going to get into some of your fun stuff too. I am newly single. I've been <laughs> Where do you live now? I live in Duluth, Minnesota. You live in Duluth, in Minnesota. I travel a lot to LA for work and other things yeah. too. But um I hadn't started started dating, but now that I'm like I, I'm, you know, divorced. We went through all the things. It is crazy, crazy going through being single. And I'll tell you why. 
So when I used to drink, and you understand this too, the number one thing for me was I'm going to have a drink. And that is number one. It wasn't the guys. It didn't matter. I was out to get drunk. You happen to be there. Great. So I never had a problem because guess what guys love? Girls who don't say yes, that make it hard. Like the challenge. So I'd be like, I don't give a shit about you. Yeah. I'm here to drink. So yeah. I never had an issue. And what I'm noticing mm. is that now when you have to feel all the feels and you're like, wait a minute, I don't know what to do here. It is so crazy. And it's, I'm not like actively seeking, but it's just interesting even being in this weird stage where guys try to talk to me and I'm like, I don't know what this is. Like, I don't know how to handle it. Where before I'd be like, I don't give a shit. Like, I don't care. Nothing, nothing matters. So my thing right now is dealing with the dating scene, trying to be sober and I'm not even dating. And I still think it's crazy. Hello. Who is it? Who is it? Hey, how's it going? <laughs> Sorry, Welcome I just walked up. in. How many, how many months? I, have, I will have 10 months uh, in what, two, three days? <gasps> Where, where'd you grow up? Minnesota, Alexandria. Had a oh. restaurant in Northeast Minneapolis. So oh my God, I'm, I'm familiar. Oh. Tom just said Duluth. So I said, who's that? Daily. Yeah, I'm Andrew. Andrew. Daily Hi, Andrew. guy, yeah. darling. As I'm talking about dating, are you single? I'm kidding. Yes, he is. That's what I'm trying to. I, I am single. You started oh talking. You started talking. He's my. He's the radio producer. He's okay. an expert in crypto. He's oh. loaded, and he's a doll. So wait two more months, and we'll have a conversation. Do you I don't know about all that, but it's nice to meet you. Yeah. yeah it's nice nice to meet you. Okay. So Tom, what are the? What was it? Masters? The BLTSs. Yeah. What are? What are they? Let's tell the show. Let's tell the audience. So I don't think anything moves in life unless you've got the BLTSs with people. And so with Andrew and with Shiloh, I know that Shiloh knows she belongs in my tribe. I know Shiloh knows I love her. I know Shiloh knows she can trust me. And I know Shiloh knows she's safe with me. And in your relationships in your life, if you've only got one or two or three of those four, People are going to sign up with you, but they're not going to be all in with you. But anybody that you've got in your life with all four of those things, where they belong, where they feel loved, where they feel that they can trust you and that they're safe, they'll do anything for you. So my entire life, 33 years into this thing, is the BLTSs. And on the other side of that, if something's missing in a relationship, it's so easy for me to spot that something's missing and go back and fix it if I can, but at least clean it up no matter what. And I got all that from Alcoholics Anonymous too. So very, very cool stuff. It is. Well, when I, okay, so I, not only did I get sober, then I get separated. <laughs> and one of the best things you said to me, you said, number one, you are not, you cannot date for a year. <laughs> I was like, remember what I told you about the three M's? Yeah, the three M's. That's what I want you to repeat. Okay. I, I, I remembered it the entire time. <laughs> so I'm telling you, in that first year of sobriety, you are a stranger in a strange land, which means your head and your body. And anything that looks like it's going to give you a relief, you're going to be gravitating to, whether it be food, whether it be something else. So I always say this, and it sounds a little bit inappropriate, but it's not. And that is meetings, meditation, masturbation, because you got to stay back. So that means you go to AA meetings, you find some sort of relationship with a God of your understanding, and you stay away from destructive things that you portray as love. Because man, when they take away everything from you, the first thing you want to do is fill that hole. And that's not that hole. It's a hole in your soul. And the trouble is is people have a hell of a time with it. So I say that to people because it's got shock, such shock value and it actually makes people think about it. And as they think about it, then they start saying, you know what, that might be some truth. And you, it's like you said, I told you that early on because it wasn't you I was worried about. It was all those other people surrounding you that know how vulnerable you are, that we're going to sell you a bill of goods that I didn't want happening because I love you so much. 
And I appreciate it. And I think it's important for people that are listening because they yeah. tune into this show and they know all about my story. You know, the first year of sobriety, I, I stuck to that and I really did. And there was, I was lonely. Like, I'll, I'll be honest. I was so lonely at times. I cried all the time, but at the same time, I, I wasn't lonely long. Like you have to feel it. And so obviously we numb ourselves as alcoholics, but it was all about feeling the things. And, and even now coming into even a year, there's many times I'm like, I don't know if I'm ready for these feelings. Like I, I'm doing it, but then I'm like, God, rejection sucks. I'll tell you that rejection really hurts because before I didn't care. I just go have a drink because that's my friend. My alcohol is going to take care of me. Oh, do I want to have sex? No, sex was secondary for me. It was yeah. always secondary. And my sister-in-law said something to be super funny. And she's like, oh, you don't care about sex. And she, and I was like, hmm, well, I'm sober now. So there's a very big difference there. <laughs> you yeah. actually can feel everything. Yeah, you do care about it. I mean, it's very important in your life, but I, I'm very proud of myself for sticking to all that. You know, I, 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 I have been very, very committed to taking care of myself and showing up and I'm not perfect. I don't show up every single day like I should, but I still, I, I the meetings are so important. So as we roll forward, we've got about 10 more minutes, Tom. Oh um, my gosh. I know. So what is Tom Chenault doing now? I mean, you've had a radio show for years and years. You speak on stages all the time in our industry. You've had an incredible life. You've seen success. You've seen crazy. You've seen downs. You know, what is happening now in your life and, you know, contact mapping? Let's talk about that a little bit. It's very cool. Like, I absolutely love it. So explain what the heck that is, because it sounds a little bit weird. It's in the background, but let's talk about what contact mapping is, why it's so important. Well, before we go there, I'm 70 years old and I've made a mark in the world, I believe, but I don't think I've left anything. I don't think I've left a legacy. I think when I'm gone, people are going to go, oh, look who he helped. But I didn't really, you know, I was basically the bridegroom. I, I was basically the, the groomsman, not the bridegroom. And I want to be the, I want to, I want to leave a legacy. And I tell people that my passion in my life is Alcoholics Anonymous and helping people there. I think my job is probably network marketing and money. And I think that my legacy is this contact mapping because where I have become successful, massively successful, being the train wreck that I am, the guy that lands airplanes in parking lots, the guy that gets shot at in swimming pools and stories that you would not believe, yet I always land on my feet because I was impossible to fire. And the reason I was impossible to fire was the because of the size of my <laughs> Rolodex. Didn't know I was going to say that. So anyway, <laughs> my Rolodex is that big. I mean, I have a very, very big Rolodex and I know everybody. So you can't fire me because of the repercussion of it. So I've always been bulletproof. And it started when I was very, very young in 1970. Uh, I, I ran a restaurant with 75,000 people a month going through the door. And that's a ton of, that's a ton of customers with 103 employees under the age of 18, all girls, and a clientele that was all over 50 years old. And what we would do when they came in the door was we would find the person least likely to get a compliment, like your brother. You hear you walk in the door and everybody's going, oh, look how beautiful Shadow is. And then your ugly brother standing over there going, how come nobody pays attention to me? And you feel the same way because you're sick of getting all the attention. The hot girl's always sick of that. So what happens there is we paid attention to the ugly brother or the grandmother. And we remembered something about them. And we had a Dewey Decimal System in the Crestwood and we kept notes on them. And when they came back week, next week, we brought it up. Where's your grandmother with those beautiful earrings and those, that blue hair? And everybody goes crazy. And they come back after that, after that, and after that. So then I left the restaurant. I drank my way out of the restaurant business. They fired me. And I ended up in the airplane business. I took all the clients from the restaurant business and brought them into the airplane business and sold them airplanes, broke every record there. I got drunk in the restaurant business. It took them two weeks to catch me because I had an airplane and I just flew all over the place dodging this guy named Ernie Wright, Reese. And they finally fired me and I came back to Denver and, be, and I thought, what can I sell that is where I can make a lot of money? And I thought, be a stockbroker. And I got that job, used all those contacts from the restaurant business, now the airplane business, now the stock business. And that's how I've done everything. And so, cause it's, I'm so good at remembering people, but there's no systems in place. 
the the yellow stickies, the yellow notepads, the the all the CRMs that just do so much you can't even figure out how to start the damn thing. All I want is to be able to meet people, remember people, follow people up. So this app I built with my son and a guy from uh, uh, MIT. I'm looking at my phone to show you my contact mapping app. Mm -hmm. Built this app, and the app looks like this. And what does it say so far today? I've, I've got two brand new people in my life. I've followed up 15 people and I have 20 people I yet to follow up today. That's all I need to know. Awesome. But I am the best rememberer on the planet because of this. So when I met you, how many times have I said, send me a selfie? Lots of times. Because every time I do, it isn't because I'm some sort of perv. It's because I want, I don't want your prom picture. I want you, I, I want you in your curlers with no makeup on. Right. Because I want to remember you like you are, not like, you know, some sort of fantasy. So the name of the game is I put your name and phone number in the phone. You hit the button that says save. Like, that's what you all do. And then it says, do you have a picture of Shiloh? I hit the button on Shiloh. And what does it say? Great. What do you know about Shiloh? And here comes the microphone. And I speak yeah. everything about Shiloh into the phone. I hit save. And the next thing you know, it says, when are you going to follow Shiloh up? And no isn't an answer. So I, I always put tomorrow and I follow you up tomorrow. And then if you don't like me and you don't respond, I still follow you up in a month because I refuse to accept that you don't like me. So then in a month, I keep hammering you for a month. And then you might get to the point where we're in conversation or you might just be like three months down the road or six months down the road. And all of a sudden, what I'm selling you want to buy, which is love, fire in your brain, higher in your heart. And not being all this hip slick and cool, just being completely authentic with people and treating them like human beings instead of prospects and everything changes. So the whole thing is contactmapping.com forward slash app, A-P-P, contactmapping.com forward slash app. It's free. It's impossible not to do it. You're not only going to become an unbelievable whatever you are but you're kind of going to become a much better human being and you're going to change the world with me. And I love that Shiloh. So that's what I do. That's my passion. That's my legacy. That's my life. I love that. And you are leaving a legacy. Even if you say you're not, you are, you've changed so many lives and my life. And that's, what's important to me. So, but I want you to talk about contact mapping for a second. One more time. One more so time. You, yeah. So you get drunk. You do this epic video. They get 5,000 people watch before they can pull it down. And after that, the world's watching you. Lots of people know you. Lots of people know you. Lots of Tony knows you. Yeah. But it took a guy in England named Danny to watch that video and think hard and say, who do I know in the U.S. that could help Shiloh? And he called me and I called you. That's contact mapping. Yeah. I know a guy. And all of you, how old are you, Shiloh? 40. So you're 40. How old are you? How old are you? 39, just turned. just turned 39. I might have your husband here. So at the end of the day, at the end of the day, uh, at the end of the day, so you're 40 years old. Yeah. How many years has it been since somebody looked at your report card? <laughs> Forever. Nobody Forever. cares how smart you are. We don't even like smart people. Right. We like nice people who remember us. That's why Tom Chenault is successful because I ni I'm nice and I remember you. How do you like that? I love that. I love mm -hmm. it. Yeah. And they say the perfect man for you. Have, has anybody ever given you the formula? No. Nope. Let me hear it. Your age at 30. <laughs> Kidding. That was a joke. <laughs> That's my age. <laughs> right. Perfect. I know perfect. just the guy. <laughs> <laughs> bunch of shit shows together right i always amen. say i always say i'm a sexy hot mess i'm like i'm sexy i'm just a hot mess and you gotta amen to that. That. I'm, a lot. I'm a lot oh my gosh this has been an incredible show i appreciate you for coming on everyone needs to download the contact mapping app but also just for somebody who's watching who's struggling because i have messages every episode that we talk about this we talk about alcoholism we talk about hitting that bottom Every episode, I always get a couple messages and always try to guide them to the rooms and, and get them into a place that they can be safe 
and and have friends like you and friends like me to um, support them. So I appreciate. You know, wait a second. We got. I know this guy's mad at me, but I'm. I'm going to oh, do this. I love Actually, it. Is your producer. When oh, yes. the scariest thing in the world is to go to an AA meeting, and you're absolutely you don't like yourself very much, so therefore you hate everybody in that room. Yeah. So it's because you don't like yourself. So you're, you're, you're so you have to trust. You have to have the BLTs with Shiloh or me to know that you belong, that you are loved, that you can trust us and that you're safe. And you get in there. It was astounding to me in 24 hours what happened to Shiloh. And I'm not going to talk down on her ex-husband, but I am going to say that I did get on a call with everybody and he was not buying what I was selling. He wanted his wife fixed. He just didn't want any, any part of helping fix her. And that's okay. There's a lot of history there and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But what I try to look for instantly is anything that's going to upset that apple cart until Shiloh has time to make that decision on her own, which is like a year. So I tried to get that significant other like crazy to buy into getting into a recovery program of his own to be able to support her. But what we love to say is it's Shiloh's problem. She caused it. She's got to go fix it. And what you guys need to know is every alcoholic makes 17 people sick. And then they go get sober. Shiloh went and got sober and started hanging around with all these misfits. And that's very confronting to somebody staying sick. And that's what happened. So I'm saying that to all of you because it's so important. Reach out to Shiloh, reach out to me, reach out to somebody like us that take this life and death seriously because it's life and death seriously. Would you agree with that? A hundred percent. Now glutathione is a big word, but it's the body's own master antioxidant. Oh, it's a scavenger for free radicals, for bacteria, and what's relevant now, viruses. This is new to the marketplace. There's no other product on the market that has the ingredient NASET. And basically NASET increases the production of that glutathione that is in our body already to strengthen and, and enhance our, our immune system and keep it strong. Elevated sense of well-being. Supports muscle strength and endurance. Cognitive function. Powerful liver support. It's energy. Helps blood sugar regulation. Superior bioavailability of key ingredients. One of your best defenses against COVID mm -hmm. is a strong immune system. Taking GSH Plus as a daily supplement does all that. Now we have the product out on the market.